Hello and welcome to another Solana tutorial. Today we're gonna talk about Umi. I have no idea what that actually is, but it was requested so many times that I just have to make a video about it. If you wanna have me talk about a video, you just gotta nag me long enough until I make a video about it. And that's what happened with Umi. So let's look into that. Yeah, what I know is something something Solana development. Okay, good. I think it's one of the Metaplex SDKs or whatever that allow you to do stuff. But to really find out what it's actually about, let's dive in and uh, find out together. And don't you worry, I'm gonna make a very in-depth tutorial, of course. Because I know so much about Umi. It can't be so difficult, can it? Okay, so into the corner we go. Umi. Metaplex Foundation, well, that sounds about right. It's definitely not the sushi place. Yeah, okay, okay. Umi, a framework for JavaScript clients. Umi is a modular framework for building and using JavaScript clients for Solana programs. A zero dependency library. Well, that's helpful. And I think Umi is one of those that was referenced by the Web3.js, the new one. Is that correct? So. Metaplex Foundation, lots of Umi stuff. So, yep, it is referenced by the Web3. So understanding how Umi works is probably gonna be very helpful also for the Web3.js. It defines a set of core interfaces that libraries can rely on without being tied to a specific implementation. Also provides a set of default implementations for devs to get started quickly. Okay, got it. Oh, that's nice. That's all the stuff that we can do. Well, let's start with installation then. Create Umi. <laughs> so we just npm install those packages. Metaplex Foundation Umi. Umi just sounds so fun. Aufi Orvi Umi. <laughs> In Austrian German, Umi is like to go over there with a direction. Upwards, downwards, like sidewards, like there. Umi. Get my Umi. Anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, we install that and then bundle default because we want some default implementations. And we get the Solana Web 3 chest. Do we really? I thought we can get around without that. Mock storage implementation. npm install. Yeah, let's just do this one. And I'm gonna install that locally. So I'm gonna save it in here. And then I npm install those two in here. Oh no, what the? Something, something again with Solana Web 3.js. So apparently it somehow has a dependency on the Solana Web 3.js or is it the other way around? I mean, Solana Web 3.js has a dependency on the UMI while resolving undefined, undefined. I still don't get it. Oh, I didn't name that correctly, did I? It's node modules. Try that again. Oh yeah, that looks better. So I installed it into some other folder where I had other dependencies as well. So anyway, forget about that one, but in node modules, there we go. There we now install all the dependencies that apparently we need for UMI. Didn't it say it's like a zero dependency something? What did I install? Just Metaplex Foundation UMI and Metaplex Foundation UMI bundle test. Maybe the UMI bundle tests have all of those, all of, blah, 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 all of those dependencies. Let's check that. Check that node modules in here again, and then we install just the UMI, just because I wanna see that zero dependency thing. Okay, that in fact has zero dependencies and is just the UMI stuff. But then if I actually install it with the bundle tests, then it has a bunch of dependencies. Why did I install the Bundle tests, well, for testing, lol. Oh yeah, bundle defaults, that's what I actually wanted to install. But then let's check what the UMI bundle defaults, how many dependencies that brings with them. Yeah, also quite a few. And that's okay. There we go, we got Solana Web3. That's okay, because we want the default implementation. Probably, most likely. Okay, then you can create a new UMI instance <laughs> of Yavi UMI using the create UMI function is the UMI. 
<laughs> I'm gonna have fun pronouncing this. So I guess just a pure JavaScript or TypeScript file. Let's make a new file. Pump that here. Umi demo TypeScript. And then we Umi demo. What will that result in? No error. <laughs> the classic big in thing because uh, Solana, the old web 3 js kind of always the big int wherever it is, something it does like. But anyway, I didn't get an error or anything. So I'm assuming that this will do the trick of creating myself an UMI instance, whatever that is. So yeah, let's have a look. UMI, <laughs> tell me what you can do. It has a downloader, it has a EDDSA. What would that stand for? Public key cryptography. Edwards curve, digital signature algorithm. Digital signature algorithm I could have derived, but Edwards curve, okay. Okay, what else? HTTP, identity, payer programs, RPC, uploader, use. So this stuff is, as it said, an interface. So UMI provides us with the interface such that those things always look the same. Like get transaction, send transaction, get rent, get cluster, get balance. And whatever we use under the hood then depends on the specific implementation. But UMI abstracts that away. UMI just provides, you know, the interface. That's the concept of an interface. We always have the same methods and then it doesn't matter what's running in the background. So yeah, I mean, it pretty much shows us what we can do here anyway. Let's first get the balance of an account. So there it just wants a public key because it has the RPC interface and it takes a public key. So this one, where does it come from? public key t address extends string. Okay, no, it's not the same as in the web three defines a public key as a base 58 string. So that's something different than what we are used to in the web three chairs. This thing is in common in UMI public keys. So in here, this file. So there's a different way how to do this. Let's see. Let's define a pub key as a public key from UMI because there are different ones. Wh which one is this? You are from Solana Web3. That's not the one I want. And you are the one from Metaplex Foundation. That's the one I want. So we're gonna import that. How do I do one? I create myself another address here. There we go. UMI. Is that how I create a pub key? Actually, I would expect it to be like this. String is not assignable to pubkey. Okay. See, that's why I'm doing this here live for you. So shall we learn how we set all of these things up? That I don't come with any like pre, uh, like uh, made up ideas of how it works and I not just write it down. No, we're gonna figure this out together, my friends. And hopefully by that, I can also teach you how you find out those things for yourself if you're dealing with a new library. Because I've never worked with UMI before and yet I'm pretending to teach you something about UMI. So I can do that because I have an understanding of how libraries work and how I can find out how stuff works by reading source code because I'm a deaf. That's what we do. We read source code. And then we try to understand it and we're like, what does that even mean? Something, something public key. The easier way is of course to read documentation, but that's boring. So that's also not how this works. Only refers to a type, but is being used as a value here. Okay, granted. Let's go the easy route and read documentation. Cause we were like, UMI's interfaces, public keys and signers. We'll see how to manage public keys and signers with UMI, uh, in UMI. So in UMI, a public key is a simple base 58 string representing a 32 byte array. Ah, we get that type if it has been verified as valid. Okay, so in short, in reality, we can create it with lowercase pub key. Aha, uh -huh, with that helper method. Okay, I mean, 
Granted, reading documentation is probably the easier way to figure stuff out because finding that thing would have probably taken me a while. I would have probably figured it out, but it's definitely easier to just look it up how it works. And the cool thing about that is if we do that and it's not a valid key, then it throws an error. In fact, let's let's get me that. Pop key. Input from Metaplex. That sounds about right. So that's a helper method. It's literally a method that we are calling to give us the pop key. And what it does, we don't really see, but implicitly it asserts that the pop key is valid. I can force it that it does not, but it will throw me an error if that wasn't a valid address. So if I store that, save that, run that, it should give me the pop key. I'm also gonna print it. Should do to string. We'll see what we get back if we just log it like this. There we go. And we get our pop key. And if it was an invalid pop key, like this, then it would tell us invalid pop key, thereby guaranteeing that once we have this pop key object, we checked that it's a valid pop key. I mean, we can also force it to say, don't check argument of type not assignable to safe public key input. Okay, but then we need a safe public key input. Wait, no, that's just for the second one. If it's already saved, then we can say false, but if it's just a public key input, argument of type false is not assignable to parameter of type true. That's a type true, it must be true. <laughs> okay, it must be true or not present. That's cool. Whereas here it can be false, but then we need a safe public key input. Anyway, all of this is just so that once we have this public key object, we can be sure that it's actually a valid public key because otherwise our methods, how to get it, won't give us a public key. And so that's safe through the types, which is pretty cool actually. So let's make it a valid public key again such that the method does not fail and it just prints as our public key. So far so good. We can create a public key with Umi. Isn't that great? And there is much more that you can do with those. You can convert it to a uint8 array using the public key bytes if we want the individual bits for that. Now, question to you, my student. Import that from Metaplex Umi. Question to you, what do we know? Like how can we check now that the output of this is correct? There is something that we know about, for instance, the first byte of our public key. What do we know? Think about it because we talked about public keys a lot. Why did we do that? Also in the encodings video? I think in the encodings video, yeah. I always reference the encodings video, so apparently it's important. What is the first byte? No, it's not zero but it's also not a large value. So it's gonna be a very low first byte. And let's execute that and check if that is correct. It is definitely a low first byte here, 13, definitely not a high byte because we get to the lowercase u. So seeing that I can assume that this works correctly because my assumptions were not broken. If I got a zero byte here or like a very high one, then I would be like, oh, that looks weird. If I wanted to make it a zero byte, I could do something like this. And then I have the zero here. So this public key bytes seems to work and actually give me the proper uint8 array of the public key I provide. All right, all right, moving on. Then there are some helper functions. Like, is it a public key? Make sure that it's a public key. Deduplicate an array of public keys. Okay, so if I have a lot of public keys, then I can just get the unique ones. And the default public key, which is just a public key with all zeros, which is also the address of the system program. That's just some helper functions. And then there's more. We can work with PDAs and we can work with signers. And again, the UMI documentation is pretty neat. Pretty sure Loris worked on that. Thank you, Loris. So of course it is neat. And again, that's all just interfaces to make it easy to work with for us because it will always be the same. And it abstracts away the behind the scenes stuff. Key pairs, 
a public key and the secret key. So yeah, there is a bunch. Oh, are we already going through all of the documentation? Let's have a look at the overall interfaces, core interfaces. Make it easy to interact with the Solana blockchain. We have signer, that's the thing representing the wallet, you know, that can sign transactions and messages. This EDDSA interface, an interface to create key pairs, find PDAs, sign verify using the EDDSA algorithm. Then the RPC interface, interface representing a Solana RPC, transaction factory interface, interface allowing us to create and serialize transactions. So that's how we build the transactions then. Uploader interface, interface allowing us to upload files and get a URI to access them. Well, it's just an upload, upload JSON. And again, that's just an interface. Whatever is behind that is then responsible for the actual implementation of how the upload is done, like to which service, you know? I feel like I didn't do a good job in explaining what an interface really is. I'll get to that in a second. HTTP interface, an interface allowing us to send HTTP requests. Send, response to the request data, gives us a promise for a HTTP response for the response data. So it's typed always. And essentially the interface is just there is a method called send, which takes the request and gives us a promise for the HTTP response. That's all it is. That's all that UMI does. But then there are the default implementations that actually implement how it works that we can get an HTTP request. And last but not least, there's the program repository interface for registering and retrieving programs. Then we have a bunch of others that are not core interfaces. Then we have the context interface. Ah, that's what we saw with this one. That's the context interface. The interfaces above are all defined in a context that can be used to inject them in your code. So the context interface basically contains all of those core interfaces. The UMI interface is a context. So it's built on top of the context and adds the use method. Right, so we can use wallet adapter identity or use AWS provider or use and or use my program repository. And that's the cool thing because then we only need to have one implementation that uses this UMI interface. Because if we always go through this thing, right, if we access all our, the HTTP stuff, for instance, through this thing and use this send method, then our code doesn't change if we suddenly were to use a different provider than AWS, right? We change from AWS to, I don't know, whatever, Google or Arweave. And all we need to do is put in a different HTTP interface, another implementation for the HTTP interface. So this thing, the HTTP interface, we just swap it for something else and the rest of the code stays the exact same. That's the advantage of interfaces. That's why we want to have interfaces such that we can write our code in a general concept just using the UMI interfaces and then the concrete implementation, what is actually being used in the background that we then just plug in and it implements the correct methods. The interface implements the methods. So it guarantees that those methods exist on the thing we plug in there. Otherwise we couldn't plug it in if it's not a HTTP interface, which more concretely means it has this send method, then we can't put it in here, right? Or what is this, the AWS uploader? I think that's for this thing, the uploader interface. What does that one have? Uploader interface probably has an upload function. It has a get upload price and it has an upload and upload JSON. So this interface makes sure that whatever we plug in here has those three methods or properties and only then will it allow us to plug it in there, right? So this AWS uploader must have those three properties and the types make sure of that. But as a result, the rest of my program that is now using this UMI context doesn't need to care whether it's AWS or Google Cloud or Arweave or whatever uploader there might be, 
your custom uploader, for instance, you can write your own one, you just need to, you know, implement those three things. But for the rest of the application, the code stays the exact same because it just uses the interfaces. That is the advantage of interface, a classic design pattern that is used a lot in computer science, like in programming. Interface is probably one of the most used ideas and pretty much every higher level programming language supports interfaces and see that's abstract classes with just public methods. But yeah, that's, that's details. Uh, welcome to procedural programming. That's what I taught there. But yeah, so I hope that by now you understand what an interface is and why that is so helpful and therefore why UMI is helpful because it provides those interfaces that we can as developers just use the UMI interface and then plug in whatever implementation we want to use at that point without having to rewrite any of our code except for that one line where we plug it in. Yeah, okay, so that's the interfaces. Interface implementations. Bundles, the default bundle, the test bundle. Use Solana's wallet adapters. Use Solana's Web3.js. So one of the implementations for the RPC interface is the one from Solana Web3. Actually, maybe let's have a look at that, such that you see what's happening here behind the scenes. Uh, maybe we start with... Let's have a look at this RPC interface. Where was it here? The RPC interface has the following methods, airdrop call, get slot, send transaction, get balance. For instance, let's look at the get balance. It takes a public key and options. Then if we look at the source code of the implementation, so that's not the interface. The interface was just, this needs to exist. And now the implementation, this is in here. The UMI RPC Web 3.js is one of the implementations of the UMI interface, the default implementations. Here it's just the install, so it's probably in the other file. Here, what was I searching for? Get balance. There we go. So this is then the implementation. It says get balance, like it does here, and it returns a promise for a sol amount returns a promise for a sol amount, and then that is the actual implementation. And the actual implementation is what we are used to from the Solana Web 3.js, which is get me the connection and on that one call the get balance for this public key. So first we need to convert it to a Solana Web 3.js public key. That's the two Web 3.js public key function here, which probably also doesn't do anything uh, particularly surprising. That's imported from umiweb 3 js adapters, public key. There we have the to and the from, that basically just converts those two types, right? The public key from Metaplex to a web 3 js public key and the other way around, which, you know, here we just have a new public key with the public key address. This gives us, if we just put it in here, gives us back the string and we can create a new public key with a string as we're used to in the Solana Web 3.js. So that will just return that. Nice. So as I said, nothing surprising here. So we just call the get balance on the connection with our public key and the options that are pretty much the same. And we return Lamperts of the balance and Lamperts once again, that seems to also be a helper function from UMI. I mean, I've downloaded it. I can just look at it here. That thing creates us a sol amount from the provided Lamperts, which is a big int input because that thing returns us a big int and then we make Lamperts. Interesting. So a sol amount is also an amount with the ticker sol and nine decimals. And then we have the basis points denoted in decimals. So if I write one, then it's one Lampert because basis points start with nine off. Can also have one with two. Anyway, so the basis here is different. Basis points in like trading are different. They are like a hundredths of a percent, I think. So that would be four decimals, right? Anyway, point is that method that gives us a sol amount back. So it's a helper function that returns the sol amount. Yeah, and then there are a bunch of 
bunch of uh, functions that allow us to work with those amounts and do checks on that. I don't want to go through like everything because obviously there's just way too much. I just want to give you a broad idea of what UMI is about and then the details you can figure out for yourself. I just want to give you a, an overview of what are all the things that UMI can do and why is it useful to use UMI over just a regular let's say Solana Web 3.js implementation. Uploader interfaces. We have AWS, Iris, NFT storage, local cache to mock uploads and downloads. So just on disk. So we have those like four, well, really three implementations, default implementations for AWS or NFT storage as a valid uploader implementation. Downloader, HTTP interface, or again, mockups, and also the HTTP interface uses the fetch API via node fetch. So node fetch is the actual implementation and UMI provides the interface. And we have an implementation with node fetch, but you can also have your own HTTP send implementation that does whatever you want it to do. And you can put that into an application that uses UMI really easily because the methods don't change. You just need to plug in your right interface. Okay, cool. Should we just set ourselves the goal again to send a simple transaction? Maybe once again, a simple system program transfer instruction and see how simple that is with UMI? Because I know how simple it is with Web3.js and the new Web3.js and the Rust SDK, but I haven't tried it with UMI yet. So let's do that. And I'm pretty sure we'll learn something on the way. Because we've worked with pub keys now, We'll also need to work with key pairs and transactions and RPCs, but UMI provides all the interfaces for us. Transactions, RPC, identity, payer, which is both signers, identity and payer, both use the signer interface. Because the payer doesn't necessarily need to be the identity, it usually is, but in some cases we want it to be different. So where do we want to get to? We want to get to send transaction, uh, transaction. And that thing is, of course, the interface for a transaction, not from Solana Web 3, but from UMI. So how do we get that? Probably from UMI transactions create. Yeah, I mean, that sounds about right. Transaction input. Well, what could that be? Either a legacy or a v0 transaction input. Let's go with version transactions. Let's see a v0. It's a transaction input base and version is zero and address lookup tables. And that again reminds me of the new web3.js because it is what the new web3.js uses. So that's exact. I've, I've seen this before, right? But now we can build the transaction with UMI, so with the interface, like with the methods given through the interfaces. So we don't need to really look under the hood, just need to find out what that actually is, right? And again, I'm making it difficult for myself again by trying to figure it out myself instead of reading the amazing docs that Loris wrote. Transactions, sending transactions. Transaction create. Oh, and I just put in those things, nice. The transaction factory interface can also be used to serialize and deserialize transactions. Right, okay. Oh, and there's a transaction builder. Even more easy. Haha, <laughs> I can just... Wow, how simple is that? But yeah, let's start with the trivial way of putting in the things manually. So literally, yeah, I can just provide the things that I need. A version... We're going to do a version transaction, version zero. We're going to provide payer and instructions and the block cache. Start with instructions. Now here again, we could have a look at how to build instructions. Oh, well, that's not what I want. MPL toolbox. But then I would need to probably get the MPL toolbox. Program libraries can write their own helper methods that return transaction builders so they can be composed together by the end user. Like Tok Metadata did with the create NFT or the MPL toolbox did with the add memo or transfer sol. So this instruction, it just needs keys, program ID and data. 
And again, I could do it manually or I would import the Solana Web3 and do the transfer. But there are those wrappers. I don't know what I do. I'm gonna use the same trick as here. So that's the standard way how I would do it like with Solana Web3. So I'm gonna put a to-do here to do that different. And this thing I would like to import from somewhere. I need those adapters. There we go, then I should be able to import that. There we go. And then since this is a Metaplex instruction, like a UMI, and transaction instruction from Solana Web3 is not convertible to this instruction, I'm gonna use the same trick, which is also in here in this adapter, and do it to, no, I need from a web3.js instruction. And then here I say from web3.js instruction, all of this. That's how I convert back and forth from it. The implementations are in those adapters. But yeah, I still have a to-do here because I wanna see how the native way to do it with UMI is, but for now let's keep this instruction. And then this needs some more things, of course, like a block hash, which again, I'm gonna get from an RPC, get latest block hash, which gives me a promise for block hash with expiry block height. And here I have, I'm gonna await this. I can't top level await, I know, shut up. Um, but then I have the block hash here. So very similar to what I'm used to anyway. And the last thing I still miss is the payer, which is just gonna be my pub key. Okay, but that looks good. Then I send that transaction. Actually, let's execute that and see what happens. I mean, at some point there will be an error. I just wonder how far in I get my error. Yeah, I can't wait on... I, there is a way on how to do that. Somebody told me ES run. How do I get that? I install ES run. Yeah, and I just say ES run my file probably. Invalid Unicode sequence. Okay, I can't be bothered to find out what's going wrong here, so which is not. Because I don't get it to work, I'm staying with my TS node and not do top level awaits. So now I can await here. What's the next error? The next error is transaction signature verification failure which is fair because I didn't sign anything. So yeah, <laughs> obviously. But yeah, that means we already got quite far. We got until here. Okay, so that transaction should be signed. UMI transactions. No, that's transaction building. Payer, there we go. Sign transaction. And that gives me a promise for a transaction. So Yes, again, people are gonna complain. Why do you do it like that? It's not supposed to be like that. Shut up. I do it the way how I can easily learn. So we sign the transaction. The question is, what do we actually sign with? The payer. And that again, so what did we put in as the payer? Well, nothing yet, so that ain't gonna work. There, trying to use a null signer. Did you forget to set signer in your UMI instance? Yes, I did. So we gotta tell UMI, hey UMI, can you please use signer identity, signer identity, signer set payer. That gives me a UMI plugin and the plugin we can put into the use such that UMI uses the plugin. That makes sense. So yeah, we use a signer identity with the following signer. Now we need to have actually a signer. So we can either generate a signer, uh, generate a signer identity, which already also gives me a plugin. Sets the identity to the payer to a randomly generated signer. So with that, I generate a new key pair which is something I can do, but what if I want to use my my key pair from here? Uh, let's look in the doc. Oh, Kenobi, that is a topic for the next video probably.
There's so much to play around with. Yeah, we're gonna do that in a future video. Um, where was I? I wanted to find signers. Do we do we do we do we do signers? The public key sign measure. We can create one and set the signer, but therefore we already need to have a signer. How do we get the signer? We can work with key pairs, generate key pairs. This generate signer just does the generate key pair under the hood. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Umi doesn't have a get key pair from file because that is again an implementation and Umi is just a bunch of interfaces. So that's not really relevant there. So I could go with my classic way how I read my file like I would with the web3.js, you know, something like json parse and so on and so on. Or I just create a new one and I just say here, generate signer. And then I set the identity to my signer. A context, you need a context. What is a context? Oh, sure. I give you Umi as the context, right? Because you need to access the umi.eddsa. Mm -hmm. And without that, you can't access that. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so that's why I put the context again in here to get the signer out. And then I set the signer to be used as the identity and also payer I'll also set to the same signer. So I'll fee pay and sign with the same signer, but then I'm gonna do it the other way around. I'm gonna send to this UMI address and I'm gonna send from the signer public key also to web3.js public key. And what I then also need to do is before I send the transaction, I gotta await a UMI RPC airdrop to my signer pub key. I don't know, one soul. Can I set that? Is that a valid amount? No. Uh, how do I get Lamperts? But Lampert by Sol is also a Solana Web 3 stuff. Must be a cleaner way to do this. Would Sol work? Amount of Sol gives me a Sol amount. Ha, perfect. Yeah, this is so nice. I airdrop myself one sol. Mm -hmm. I could probably even do 0 0.1 sol. Probably also work. And then I send that transaction, which gives me a promise for a uint 8 array. Probably the signature returns the signature of the sent transaction. So that's then gonna be a signature in the way how we're not used to seeing signatures because used to seeing signatures, we're in base 58 encode. Let's try this. Okay, we're ready. Gone. It's gone. The RPC caller parameters have been disabled. Oh, because I created this on mainnet better. Well, obviously too bad, but uh, we don't get any airdrops on mainnet. Ah, but on devnet, eh? airdrop two failed internal error, internal error. Right, so you really don't like doing airdrops, huh? Yeah, but here I dropped myself five sol, that worked. Okay, I guess I need to find a way how to load this. Like I already started to try it before. So yeah, let's do that. Key pair from secret key, JSON, pass, file system, read this file. And then we should have my Solana Web 3 key pair. Bad secret key. Didn't like that. This is not UMI specific stuff now. This is just me being stupid. Bad secret key. What is the secret key? Yes, always log your secret. Never log your secret. Unless you're debugging and you're definitely gonna remove that message later. I mean, that looks good. Looks like a secret key. Why do I get the bad secret key size? You expect a uint 8 array? 64, that's, we have 32 byte public keys and 64 byte private keys. Why do you say bad secret key size? I don't get you. What am I doing wrong? Setting the type to u int 8 array might not be enough. Maybe I really need to say u int 8 array from this. That might be it. Yep, that looks better. 
and then we spam the server for some reason. Cool, okay, so we can load our secret from file, amazing, okay, that's a, that's a start. And then essentially we want this key pair instead of this signer, so we don't create a new one, but there's probably a conversion again from key pair, from key pair, key pair. And that gives me a key pair, which is not a signer, it's a key pair, okay. How do I get from the key pair to the signer? I have a key pair and I want the signer, how do I do that? Key pair. While UMI relies on the signer interface, it also defines a key pair type and key pair signer type that are explicitly aware of their secret key. Aha, uh -huh. so the key pair is essentially a signer, but we know the secret key. So signer is more general, key pairs are signers, but signers are not necessarily key pairs because they can be, you know, a wallet that signs and we don't actually know the secret key but the wallet can then do the signing. Okay, so to get to a signer, create signer from key pair. That sounds about right. And that I can hopefully import from Metaprox Foundation UMI. That thing needs the context and the key pair. So we again need UMI in here and then the key pair. Okay, perfect. And then we have a key pair signer, which is again, still a signer. So that will now work again. Perfect. We then set the correct identity and payer. We add this instruction and we sign the transaction with this context. So that should then create the signed transaction. And then we don't need that airdrop anymore and we can send the transaction. Let's see if that will do. Yes, nice. So that's the signature that we got back. But again, we don't really like to work with signatures like that. We like to have them base 58 encoded such that we can double click and paste them in an explorer. And there we go, Bayham. We as the UM1 sent a system program transfer to ourselves because apparently I still have the destination, the pub key, which is also that guy. <laughs> so nothing happened, but the system program transfer was still called and we still transferred 0.1 sol, uh, 0.01 sol. So that worked. We can send transactions with UMI. Nice. Now, this is still not UMI, but we know how we can then make it UMI again. And here, this part is still very not UMI-like because we rely on the Web3.js stuff. So let's have a look at how we can do it with the transaction builder, because that could also be a very helpful thing. So instead of this manual, da, 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 manual instruction creation and transaction building, we want a, let's call it, TX transaction builder. And we get that with transaction builder, which we can import from, you guessed it, Metaplex Foundation, UMI. Then we can say transaction builder dot add. And this is some transaction builder items input. What can that be? A wrapped instruction or several wrapped instructions or a has wrapped instruction or several has wrapped instructions. And a wrapped instruction is the instruction with signers required for the instruction. Aha. Uh -huh. So those wrapped instructions, there are already some builds out there like the MPL toolbox that has this transfer sol that gets me the wrapped instruction. So yeah, let's do that. Let's add this package. Let's add the MPL toolbox import from this toolbox after it's been installed. We can have the arcs, da, 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 da. Create loot, create token. Oh, wow, there's a bunch. Add memo, burn token, close token. All of those things, they have, we have all the wrappers for, you know, creating instructions. Initialize multisig, wow, that has a lot. Transfer soul, transfer tokens, transfer tokens checked. So we want transfer and then yeah, add memo because it was, but that's literally the same as the documentation does. So let's do something else. Create an account, lol. So first of all, 
first let's start with just one transfer sol you need the context which is umi and then you need the input which is i have no idea can you suggest it yes you can the amount and the destination sweet 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 and if i don't provide a source it probably takes my identity not the payer the ad identity fairly sure at least but I mean, it's both the same here anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Amount 0 0.01, wait, amount in what? Sol amount, so yes, of course, I need to say it like this again. So 0 0.01 sol and my destination. Now let's do a generate. What's the UMI way to get a random pub key? Okay, well then let's create a new key pair. Just generate key pair and get the public key from that one. That's the only way or one of the ways how I can have a random destination. Destination unknown, no, 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 known. Du, 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 du. My brain, as soon as something musical comes up, it just goes crazy. Anyhow, so that should add me the instruction for the system program transfer. Oh, and then I can split it if it gets too big. Interesting. Set the version. I can say use legacy. I can say use v2. I can set the fee pair. I can set the block hash. And also a bunch of getters, of course. And how do I get the transaction out of that then? By builder build. Again with the context. Ooh, I can even say build with latest block hash with the context because the context has the RPC as well. And then you can just call from the RPC the get block hash. So that's nice. That's what I want to do. So I'm just going to await my transaction builder. Build with latest block hash. Ooh, I can build and sign. Build with latest block hash. Can I build and sign with latest block hash? Build with latest block hash and sign? <laughs> we'll see if I still need to sign. So the context needs to have transactions, RPC and payer. So it needs the payer, the RPC and the transactions. Yeah, so you just get the UMI context again. Easy, easy. And then we have the transaction. We're gonna attempt to just send that transaction because I wonder if the builder already signs it. Let's see. If we get a invalid transaction signature, then we still need to sign it. And we get a, yep, signature verification fail. So we still need to sign it here and then put the sign transaction here. Then it should work. Nice. Or alternatively, we could say here, build and sign, but then we need the recent block hash. Like this, it's not, it will probably not work or maybe it will, we'll, we'll see. Maybe build and sign also gets it the recent block hash if uh, there's none provided. Cool. Maybe build and sign also gets the block hash. Let's see what's happening. Haha. -ha. Okay, I already saw it. Build and sign also just does the await for build with latest block hash. So build and sign is another step above. So we first build with latest block hash and then we sign. So if we say build and sign, then we don't need to do this anymore. We don't need to get the sign transaction. So this is now the quickest way how to get myself that transaction for transferring one sol. Pretty simple, huh? I mean, it's getting simpler and simpler. Like, And here, like really, it abstracted pretty much everything away, right? We just say what we want. We want to transfer sol, how much and to where. And like how it's actually done, how the transaction is built. This is like all abstracted away behind those interfaces. And the default implementations just work with the Solana Web 3. But we can add our own interfaces to that. This is so cool. This is actually really nice. Yeah, because if we have that now, then if we suddenly have some other means of signing, then we just put something else in the context, right? Instead of our key pair signer that we get from our file system wallet if we now suddenly want to use you know a wallet like phantom software backpack whatever then we just need to plug in the right adapter into the umi identity and pair like use an adapter instead of this key pair and the code will be the same and that's pretty cool that is pretty cool yeah we can then of course also add more instructions like builder 
add uh, what else did I do? I, I create account because creating a random account is fun. Again, the context and then the input needs. Yep, there's the classic what you do for creating an account. Lamperts, how much rent do we need for a few bytes? I don't know. I'll just put let's do 64 bytes because that's just a nice number. Just a nice number of Lamperts, you know? And to round it up, then we need the new account. So the address, that is what type? New account needs to be a signer. So um, just um, new key pair. And like above, I want to create signer from key pair. Then we have a key pair signer. All right. Then we need the program ID. So which program do we assign it to? That's a good time to try out this, their default pub key for system program. And then we still need the space, which I said is 64. Okay, now we need to import this. Then what's going on here? Oh yeah, I forgot the context, of course. I'm getting good at this Umi stuff. Like two hours in and I understand it. Yeah. So yeah, Umi is quite cool. So far, can recommend. Especially because the new web 3 js is using that as well. So you might as well expose yourself to it. That seems like a smart thing to do. So yeah, now we built that transaction with this additional create account for no reason. Am I creating an account? This is just demoing that we can create an account. Really not that useful, but hey, we can now. Oh, well, that's not what I expected. Hold on. The instructions did not make it into my transaction. Something is not working here. We add, we add, but then apparently maybe I'm missing something. Hey, <laughs> for all of that stuff, there's even a nicer way to do it since that's a very common task. There's another helper where we just send and confirm. You may send a transaction without waiting for it being confirmed via the send method of the transaction builder. No building, just sending. Send it. Oh, I need to await. And we have a signature, but did the instructions make it into that transaction though? No, also not. I think I'm still missing something, but the sending the transaction worked, so that's fine. He says let here, does that make a difference? Maybe because mine is const, it doesn't change stuff. I mean, that would be highly weird if that would now change, but no, it doesn't. What am I missing? Ah, now I get it. Since the transaction builders are immutable, we must be careful to always assign the result from add and prepend methods to the new variable. The same goes for other methods. Ah, ha, ha, ha. That's why. Okay, and that's why you made it mutable as well, because it's always like this equals this equals. But then the quicker way to write this is to just go like this, like this, and then like this, like this, and so on. Until we, if we do it all in one, I can keep it const, lol, because it's only the very last one, the transaction builder, and then I send it. But yeah, better let it mutable. That was my problem. I get it. Now, nice. We get simulation errors, simulation failed transaction results in an account with insufficient funds for rent. How so? Did I not put enough Lamperts? Transferring Sol, that amount should be fine, but rent for 64. Oh, I'm missing a zero here. That's why. Okay. But now, but that's a good sign because that means it actually put that instruction in the transaction now. Here we go. That's what I wanna see. Send a transaction. Nice blockage. Very caps. Yes, where we actually pay something for that account and send some salt to another random address. Great. So we transfer and we create account both through UMI and that transaction builder. Pretty nice. And that's essentially how you work with UMI. 
Now, of course, there is a bunch more that you can do, like working with PDAs, we didn't go into detail here, or, you know, fetching account, uploading, downloading, all that stuff that we did not cover today, but there is good documentation on it. If there is something where you say, oh, I really can't figure that out, please Andy, help me, just keep bothering me because if enough people bother me about it, I'm gonna make a video about it like I did for Umi. Again, the documentation is pretty nice. Like you'll find all of that. Literally, when I started making this video, I had no idea what Umi even is. And now I'm like, oh, that's easy to work with, right? So it can't be that difficult, right? You just got to figure out how to do those things. And it's really not that difficult. I really, compared to how much I usually struggle in my videos, today I really didn't struggle much. <laughs> so yeah. Umi, I judge a pretty cool thing. Also, because Loris is just an amazing dev. Hello, geeky friend. Shout out to you for building such a cool thing with a bunch of other people. Yeah, a bunch of other cool people. Yeah, okay, cool. Is there anything else that I should urgently cover about Umi? Helpers, amounts is one of those helper things. Because if we work with those amounts, then we can really specify what we want, like 1.23 USD or like that many Lamperts, then it's really clear what number we need because it automatically has the right amount of decimals and there's no messing around with, you know, Lamperts per sol and multiplying. I can just write sol 1.23 and it gets me the right number. And for most devs, that's just way more convenient than having a multiplication with the Lamperts per sol in there. So, you know. And then USDC has a different amount of decimals or USD in that case is two decimals. Pretty cool stuff that is in the UMI library. And yeah, most of it, like the core UMI is really just a bunch of interfaces. There, the core UMI, this is really just a bunch of interfaces. Program, we have error codes. We have a type for program with a name, public key, get error code is on cluster. It's all just a bunch of interfaces that we can use that makes it just easier to abstract stuff away and change out implementations. So essentially we use this such that our code becomes more general such that we need to change less of our code if we move to a different library. Cool. I think I'm going to end it here. Why not directly here in front of that program interface? So I hope that you learned something about UMI today. Again, it's not a comprehensive review. I'm also not one of the UMI devs. If you want like real great insight into like tips and tricks for UMI, then you need to ask someone who actually works with it. But me, I'm just a guy playing around with it for the first time because so many people told me that I should go into it. And yeah, because so many people told me I should go into it probably means that it's a pretty cool thing. If nobody uses those interfaces, then they pretty much are irrelevant anyway. Although no, even if you were the only one to use that, it's also helpful for you. So yeah, Umi, pretty cool. I recommend that you check it out as you can with those two videos about other topics. And uh, yeah, then I'll see you in my next video or one of my next videos where we're going to talk about Kenobi. I have again, no idea what that is, but it seems somewhat interesting and people told me to look into that. So that's what we're going to do soon, soon TM. But for now, I'll rest my voice and leave you with a nice library to explore. Till next time, check out Umi. And subscribe and like. <laughs> Bye. What an ending.